So I'm going to talk about dimensionality reduction, and I invite everyone to just um, you know ask questions as they come along. Uh, in this lecture, you know, one thing will build on another. We'll do some uh, tutorials in between, but it's kind of important that you follow each step because each step builds on what was done previously. Okay. So what's dimensionality reduction? Um, or can I have a show of hands? Who of you? would consider themselves more experimentalists, people that acquire data. And who is more on the theoretical side? Okay, so it's a bit of a mixture. And some are both, that's good. Um, so nowadays, when you collect data, you often collect uh, uh, gigabytes of data, and then there's a problem of what to do with it, okay? So I have some examples. So one example could, for instance, be you record you know, EEG from a human, over many hours, you have many different channels, and then afterwards you try to understand what was happening. Another example, that one is uh, particularly terrifying, is for instance, you do calcium imaging in an animal such as the zebrafish. The zebrafish is transparent, so people can basically now image the whole brain. That's like, say, something between 100,000 or a million neurons, and you can image that over eight hours. So if someone gives you the data, and a colleague of mine does this type of imaging, you know, it comes on a, on a hard disk and it's in the order of terabytes. Um, I personally already gave up on that because I couldn't load it into my computer, but you know, some of you may have to deal with that. Uh, another example which I'm a lot more familiar with is large-scale elect electrophysiology, where you basically record you know, hundreds or thousands of neurons, either simultaneously over also, uh, 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 or also scan sub uh, seek subsequentially over many days, and then you want to analyze that. And that is one of the things we're actually going to do today and tomorrow. We're going to analyze some electrophysiological data, but the techniques you're going to learn, you can apply to pretty much any data set, okay? So, I know that, especially if you're more from the experimental uh, world, that and you just come out of the masters or so, your thinking may be a little bit the following. Um, you know, you get this data, and then you're kind of looking for that software package that you can push your data through to get out a result. Unfortunately, you know, the state of the field is not quite at that level where we can just tell you, here's the way you're supposed to analyze your data, uh, because we don't know how to analyze your data, okay? And that means, unfortunately, that you have to learn yourself how to analyze your data and how to extract things. So this particular way actually usually does not work. Okay? You need to understand what you're doing. Now, one way in which you could handle the problem is, and I think many people do, and it's kind of like you know, where I get my job security from, is to replace that software package by a theorist. Okay? So someone that helps you analyze your data. But that's also not really what you want as an experimentalist, okay? You don't just want to outsource the problem to someone else that then tells you what to do with your data. What you really want, okay, and that is the goal of this lecture, what you really want is you want to be able to, you know, understand yourself what to do with the data. Then you can still collaborate with people, etc. but I think it's important to gain an understanding what the methods that you're going to use actually do with your data, okay? Um, both maybe because you want to understand things, but also to be on the safe side of not making, you know, what with hindsight may seem silly mistakes. Um, <coughs> so if we have population data, so data from, you know, many channels, many neurons, or something like that, it'll usually come in the format of a matrix, for instance. Um, so here, just as an example, you know, you could imagine that you have all these different channels, so, in our case, the channels will be different neurons, so maybe they're n channels, and then you collect data over time, so each row here is, in some sense, a time series of one of these channels, okay? So, x11 will basically be the first variable in the first channel at time point number one, x12 will be the first channel at time point number two, and so on, okay? So, you can imagine that your data comes in this big matrix. So that would, that would basically be true for these examples that I've just shown you. The problem with the matrix is that it's really big, okay? So you can't just look at the, you can, may not even be able to plot the data. Now, if you have that type of data, 
then the type of methods that you may apply to it generally fall under the term of unsupervised learning. Because what you may want to do is just find structure in those channels. You know, find, for instance, points in time where all the channels co-vary or something like that. Okay? So some type of structure in the channels that you just want to extract without knowing anything else. So that we call it unsupervised learning. And examples of that, for instance, are principal component analysis, clustering, and there are many more. Okay? Now, in many experiments in neuroscience, um, what you will have, though, is you won't just have uh, these channels that you record, but you'll also have some extra parameters. So fa say, for instance, that in the case of the EEG recording, you have a subject that also does some task, and so you're measuring parameters of that task. And the same could be true for the zebrafish that maybe is seeing certain images, you know, has some visual stimuli, and there are, so there are these extra parameters or variables that you have. So you can imagine that you have one matrix, which basically captures what you're recording, and you have another matrix, which captures all these labels that basically tell you what's happening at different points in time in the environment, or what the animal is doing at different points in time, okay, the subject is doing. So that will be a second uh, uh, set of variables y. And then the type, I mean, there are many types of questions you could ask, but a common question could be, you know, to ask, you know, find structure in the channels x that somehow allows you, allows you to predict y. Obviously, you could also turn around and say, find some structure in these extra parameters y, something about the stimuli or the behavior that explains structure in x, okay? But in either case, you want to take one and explain the other. And then the general type of methods that you would apply would be called supervised, okay? And examples of supervised methods are, for instance, regression, such as linear regression, clustering, if it's supervised clustering, classification in that case, etc. And the goal of dimensionality reduction is the following. Given that some of these data sets are very big and we're mostly focused on this uh, matrix X, what you'd ideally want to do is not just use that huge matrix X, but to first extract structure in X so that you can make it low dimensional, that you can cook it down, compress it in a meaningful sense, and then you can apply, you know, your unsupervised method or your supervised method, etc. Okay? And so the question is, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to find the structure in X in either of these cases? And um, I'd say there are uh, several examples of why you would want to do it. So a very simple thing is, well, you know, you could just say that's a way of compressing the data and that saves uh, time and storage on the computer. And of course, you know, if you nowadays have a movie, or you just have a JPEG image, they are compressed versions of the original image. So that's a way in which you know, save uh, uh, space. Another reason you would want to do it, and that's the one that will interest us more, is to be able to even just look at what is going on in your data. Okay? And I'll, I'll, I'll show you why that is a problem with the example that we're going to go through. You know, what is even in the data if you have so many channels? How do you look at it? Okay, looking at it, is very important to sort of find something interesting. And then, of course, as I mentioned, you can also use then the reduced data as input into other methods, okay? But those are the general goals of dimensionality reduction. So before we go to dimensionality reduction, though, I want to um, go actually through a simpler exercise that will also maybe make clearer why you actually need or why this is a useful uh, sort of topics to know something about, okay? And that is we're going to, you know, uh, look at a particular example, look at the spike trains that were recorded in this example, and extract them in the classical way, you know, by computing parallel stimulus time histograms, etc., over many, many, many neurons, and just have you wonder, you know, what do you do with that, okay? That'll be the exercise until the break, roughly. So I call it sorting and averaging. And the example that, I'm, that we're going to work on is the following. It's a classical working memory task, more than 20 years old by now, uh, done by Ranulfo Romo, and it works as follows. You have a monkey that basically receives a vibratory stimulus frequency on its fingertip. Okay, it's a little buzz, basically, if you do it yourself, a little vibration. 
Uh, that vibration has a particular frequency and lasts for 500 milliseconds. Then there's a delay. The delay is generally three seconds long. Okay? And then there's a second stimulus. And the second stimulus, again, has a particular frequency. Now, the task of the monkey is to determine whether the first stimulus frequency was larger than the second stimulus frequency. And the monkey basically has two buttons, uh, one if it was larger, one if it was smaller, and it has to press the two buttons. And if it gets it right, it gets a little juice reward afterwards. So that's the motivation for the monkey to actually participate in this task. Um, then the various combinations of stimuli that you could show in this experiment that we are going to do, these are the stimuli that were shown. So there's this base stimulus, the first stimulus, that comes at different frequencies, and then there's the comparison stimulus that generally just comes at two different frequencies. So the frequencies here on the x and the y axis, the numbers in, the, uh, in these little boxes, so the boxes tell you one particular combination that the monkey would receive, and the number in the box actually tells you the percentage of trials in which the monkey got it correct. Uh, the exercise, though, will only work on the, uh, will ignore the correct versus incorrect for simplicity. And so what Ranulfo did is he basically recorded in many areas of the brain um, while the monkey is doing this task. So it gives you a view, you know, what's going on in the monkey brain when monkeys are doing this particular task. We'll focus on an area that's called the prefrontal cortex, a frontal area that's generally believed to be responsible for working memory. And here you have an example of one neuron recorded in the PFC. So on the x-axis is time. On the y-axis are different uh, combinations of stimuli. Um, so actually what's shown in this case is the first stimulus frequency, 18 hertz, then the first stimulus frequency, 22 hertz, and then in this case the first stimulus frequency either 10 or 26 hertz, and then depending uh, on the, um, deci on the uh, decision of the monkey, I'm not entirely sure I'm explaining this correct. But, and then you see for each of these blocks, basically several trials and the uh, uh, spike train of the neurons in these trials. Okay? That's what you essentially see. So for each of the trials, where say the first stimulus frequency was 18 hertz, you see all the spike trains, um, 10 different trials, 10 different spike trains of this neuron. That's a raster plot. Okay? It's a common way of uh, plotting the spike trains of neurons. And now what we can do is we can basically turn this type of raster plot into what's called a PSDH or peristimulus time histogram, where you basically take for each of these blocks, so if you have one of these blocks, you just average of all of these spike trains and then you smooth it with a convolution. So for instance with a Gaussian filter you smooth it and that gives you an estimate of the firing rate, the time varying firing rate of that neuron. And you if you do it for this particular neuron, this is what you would get. So here is time in second, this is the first stimulus frequency, second stimulus frequency, and here what I did is I color coded the first stimulus frequencies. So that red basically means F1 was 10 hertz, blue means F1 was 34 hertz, and then here in the second period I color code according to the decision, so whether the monkey decided yes or no, and you kind of see, you know, this neuron's firing ramps up during the delay period and the colors segregate according to the first stimulus frequency. So you see that the, fi that the neuron fires more, in this case, if the frequency was lower and it fires less if the first stimulus frequency was higher. Okay? And generally you could say that is a correlate of the short-term memory of the monkey. Since the monkey has to remember the first stimulus frequency in this delay period, Okay, what you can see here is something that correlates with that short-term memory because there's information about the first stimulus frequency F1 in the firing of this particular cell. Okay? Now the problem in the prefrontal cortex is that, you know, not all cells fire like this. If they all would fire like that, that would be great, but that's not the case. Rather, what you have is that each cell does something different. Okay? So here I'm showing you nine cells. And uh, to be honest, Ranulfo has recorded on the, on the order of thousands of cells. And so if you just look at these nine cells, you see that each cell does something different. Okay? They all have a somewhat different dynamics. 
you know, some cells like this one are very nice because they, you see the spreading of the colors during the delay period, so there's some type of short-term memory. Then you see that the decision here separates into two uh, different types of firing rates. So there's a nice correlate of the decision that the monkey is later going to uh, take. So you can predict the monkey's decision, which of the two buttons it's going to press. Uh, so this cell combines both the short-term memory and the decision. But then you have cells like this one, you know, that uh, do have different responses for the different frequencies, but then they do not participate in the decision. Or a cell like this one, you know, that does not participate in the short-term memory, but then participates in the decision nonetheless. And so you find all kind of variety. Um, and you can keep playing that game. And in fact, the very first thing I did when I got this data set is, you know, send all those cells to the printer and then come back with, uh, say, 1,000 pages of uh, individual neurons. And then you go through it. And it looks intriguing. It's kind of nice to look at it. But it's not extremely enlightening that afterwards you say, okay, now I understand what the system is doing. Okay? And so our first example will be to extract the data from the raw uh, MATLAB files that I originally got, or that Ranulfo Romo basically you know, packaged at some point, the way they handle the data, and produce these PSDHs. Okay, that'll be the exercise for more or less the next hour. And so I'll explain a little bit, and you should all have this access to this Git type engine, whatever you want to call it, on which earlier I uploaded a folder called uh, Machen's Tutorial. And in that folder, there is a file called data.zip or data.tgz, depending on your operating system. And you should try to decompress that, because that is the data. Okay? Um, but before, before you do that, actually, let me just very briefly explain again what the task is, so that you just have it in your mind, actually, okay? So here's the way the data is organized, and then we'll let look at how it's organized in the MATLAB file. But just to get a more principal idea of how the data is organized. So it's recording of uh, spike trains, uh, and they're sorted already in trials. So the way it's done is that for each of the trials, you get the following information. So every trial one, you tell you what the first stimulus frequency is, what the second stimulus frequency is, what the decision is. Turns out the decision you'll have to compute, but you can compute it easily from the information available. And then the spike times for seven neurons. That's because Renolf recorded with seven electrodes at the same time. Okay? Nowadays, that may not sound very dramatic, but I think 20 years ago, that was really state of the art. So seven electrodes at the same time, individually movable, and you have basically, basically the isolated sorted spike trains in terms of their spike times in milliseconds in seven of these channels, okay? That's what you're going to get. And then there will be trial two, and trial two again in the frequency one, frequency two, the decision, and the spike times of seven, uh, uh, just a second, seven neurons. And then you'll also get some information about, you know, what the time of the stimulus onset was for the first stimulus. So it'll give you an alignment along which you can basically compare then the spike times of these uh, different neurons. Um, but the next thing we are going to do is we're going to basically uh, move towards actually uh, dimensionality reduction. Before we do so, so just a quick wrap up of this uh, afternoon session. So in the end, if you run all of these scripts and you run this last one, Romo all PSDH, it'll generate a long MATLAB file, which I think is also part of the folder that you downloaded, which is an array, which contains an array of your number of neurons, and I think there are 370 in the end, number of conditions, and I think in this case there are actually 12 conditions, so six frequencies F1 and two decisions, and then number of time points. And that's the array we're going to work with later to run PCA. So, but let me now continue. How do you now analyze this data? You've looked at one cell, you can look at many more cells, and you see that it sort of is interesting to look at the individual cells, but it's hard to get a feeling for what is happening in the population. Um, one of the problems that you basically face, or that we face, is that these cells you know, respond in various ways with respect to the task parameters. So imagine, for instance, you were to sort them according to the stimulus, the decision, which is what we already did, 
but you could also sort them you know according to whether the animal got a reward in the end or not in this task actually if the animal gets it right it'll always get a reward um, and then you can sort of imagine that you have these different colors to indicate you know whether a cell responds to one of these parameters and then one way of looking at this set of neurons that you have is to notice that you know some of them respond very strongly to the stimulus so they get very yellow some of them respond strongly to the reward so they'll get very blue others to the decision so they get very green but different cells mix these different bits of information in various ways okay so people have called that mixed selectivity and that has been a big problem in the field so if you talked to you know people in the field 15 years ago they would be very frustrated with understanding the prefrontal cortex because you know all cells do all kinds of stuff so it was hard to basically sort through them. Yes, to an individual neuron. An individual neuron has like, uh, it selects different task parameters or is selective with respect to different task parameters in different combinations and that's called mixed selectivity. So classically, here's how people would basically uh, try to make sense of the data. So they would say, well, let's group the neurons. So you may you, you apply your favorite statistical test to sort of see you know are they selective for blue green or yellow, or in this case stimulus decision reward, and then you say all the neurons that you know respond to the reward I'm going to put into one group, all those that respond to decision I'll put in another group and the yellow ones in another group. Okay, and then the groups can be overlapping, and then what you would do is just take the averages of those groups. Okay, so what is called the population average. So if you read literature on higher order brain areas, they often have these population averages where they average over, you know, uh, some subgroup of neurons that is determined by some criteria. And so here's a way of understanding what you did in some sense. So you can imagine in, in this task that we're just investigating, you know, here's time. At time zero, the first stimulus frequency comes on, lasts for half a second, then there's a delay, and at 3.5 seconds, the second stimulus frequency comes on and you can already read out the decision of the monkey. So one way of you know looking at the data is to just plot what fraction of cells is selective say for the stimulus, for the decision, etc. Okay, so that would be classical analysis. So you would see maybe initially you know they're not selective for either and they better not be okay because there's no information about either. Then they be 25 percent of the uh, cells become selective to the stimulus then the number of cells that are selective decreases over time, then it increases a bit. And when the second stimulus frequency comes on, you know, up to 40% of the cells are selective for the decision. Okay, so you get some idea of what is happening in the data. Then another thing you could do is you could say, oh, let's, let's look at one point in time here, for instance, this point in time. And let's basically look at these cells. So how did we determine these cells? Well, in this case, we used the test, ANOVA, effect size. And you basically make it a, a, a significance level, 0.05 then you would say, well, these guys here that are dark gray, those are the ones that were significant, and the ones that are light gray are not significant, okay? And then you can average, you know, this half and that half if you want. Um, and that would be a population average. Um, <coughs> and if you do an average PSDH, so here we basically average these guys together with these, so we just flip the sign in this case, and then this would be the average for the stimulus this is the average population activity for the decision. So when we do the whole thing here, and it gives you some, you know, coarse view of what is happening in the data. But then you may wonder, you know, did I, do I have a, the right representation of the data? Is this really what is going on? Okay, so that is with this sort of ad hoc method, something that you may not be so sure about afterwards, that you really captured what was going on in the data. Okay. So an alternative to this approach is to use unsupervised methods such as principal component analysis that try to just give you a summary of the data without you know um, any bias in the way you look at it and that's what we're going to do first and then tomorrow uh, we look at some uh, steps beyond that method that we developed ourselves in terms of how to look at that data Well, the bias is in the in the experimenter, or in the in the person that does the data analysis. And that bias is hard to get rid of, but you know, they're, they're, they're the methods have different trade-offs. Let's put it this way. Okay, that's the way I would phrase it. So. Um,
it's not like the method is wrong, okay? It's a particular method, and you get out a particular answer. And I think the thing that you have to learn is what do you get out given the assumptions that you put in? That's like the crucial thing. There's no right or wrong method. The key thing to learn is what are the assumptions that go in, what do you get out, you know, and what did you learn from the whole thing, basically. That is like the key thing to learn. And uh, so it's not that PCA is better than this or worse than this. It's just a different look at the data, okay? And then tomorrow we'll do DMIX PCA, and that is not better or worse either. It's just another different way of looking at the data. Okay, so we're going to basically now uh, learn something about uh, principal component analysis. Who's had uh, principal component analysis before? All right. Who feels like familiar and can implement it from scratch in MATLAB or Python? Okay, so there are a few. So, but that's what we're going to do, okay? We're going to implement it from scratch. Uh, to, to do that, we'll need to understand it in depth first. <coughs> so we're going to ignore the task context again. We'll just look at the spike trains uh, without thinking about, you know, the frequencies, etc. So here's a recording. It's actually from auditory cortex, but it doesn't matter. You have 130 neurons, and these are recorded simultaneously, but again, you know, it doesn't really matter for what we're going to do. And here's one way in which you could sort of think about this activity, which we already did in some sense. Basically what you do is you take the spike trains within a particular uh, window here and you turn them into spike counts of firing rates. So we did it by smoothing, but you can also imagine that you just do it by window. So many people do that. Then you basically get this column in the matrix, you know, that would have the individual firing rates during this little window here and the n neurons here, so the 130 neurons in time step one. and you can imagine this 113 dimensional vector, because that's what it is, as a point in a 113 dimensional space. So I'll only plot the first two dimensions of this space, because I'm more of a two dimensional guy, okay? And then basically you get a particular point that tells you, okay, this is where you are in this space. So that would be the firing rate of the population at that particular time point. Then you can do the same thing for the next time step, okay? That gives you another vector, and that other vector is another point in that 113-dimensional space, okay? And as you keep doing that, you get a whole bunch of points. Of course, they're connected through time, but for the purposes of PCA, we're actually going to just ignore the fact that they're connected, okay? For us, they're just points at this point. They're points. And one thing that you can sort of imagine if you have lots of these points over recording, the question you could ask is, well, you know, do they really span all 113 dimensions of that 113 dimensional space, or maybe not? So in this little example, you see there are two neurons, but you know, they don't really cover the whole two dimensional space. They kind of like lie along this line, right? And similarly, in the 113 dimensional space, you could imagine that, you know, the points may be lying in a six or seven dimensional space. And then you may say, well, maybe it's useful to characterize that six or seven dimensional space as opposed to thinking about this as a 113 dimensional problem, okay? And that is the thing that PCA does for you. Um, hmm. So, let's imagine that is basically our data. Sometimes it's also called the state space of firing rates or the state space. So what you first want to do is you actually want to center the data. Okay, centering data is a common pre-processing step that just makes the math easier afterwards. And it's not particularly deep, it just kind of means you shift your whole cloud to the center of the coordinate system. And in practice what you do is you compute the mean of this cloud, which is kind of like the center of mass in physics. So you take the mean in this direction, the mean in that direction, or if you want the average over all those 113 rows that you collected in that matrix, and you subtract it. So from each data point, we subtract the mean. <coughs> if we do that, yeah, question? It's the mean um, over the rows. Yes, each row is one neuron, and so the mean is just the average firing rate of that neuron, okay, over time. It's just one number, basically, so that's what you subtract. And this is what it means, okay? Please note the subtle difference. The subtle difference is the coordinate system was previously centered at 2 hertz. It's now it's centered at 0, 
So officially, these numbers here are not negative with respect to the first or second neuron. Okay, you have negative firing rates, but it's really just because you subtracted the mean. Yeah, so that's called centering. Very common, not just in PCA, also for regression, etc. Many things get easier if you center the data first. Now the next step that we're going to do in PCA is we're going to project the data. Okay, so what is a projection? So graphically, it's shown here. The first thing you need if you want to project the data, in this case on just a line, is you need a vector that characterizes that line. That vector is called u here, and it's a unit vector, so it has length 1. Okay? Mathematically, if you want to project onto that line, what you want to get is you want to take one of these blue points and you want to get that red point back. Okay? And this is the equation that does it for you. So xi is the original vector. You take u times xi, u transpose times xi, that's the inner product or the dot product. Who has not heard of the inner product or dot? I should ask it positively. Who knows what the inner product or dot product is? Okay, so most of you know it. Um, so u transpose xi, that is an inner product or a dot product, that gives you a single number. Okay? And that single number tells you how far from this zero point you have to go out along u. Okay? So it tells you the distance from here to this red point. And then what you do is you multiply this number with the vector u, and that gives you back this point now as a two dimensional point. Okay? That's basically what a projection is. Yeah? So it's kind of that's actually the key thing to learn in PCA is what is a projection. I think it's like there are like really only two things to learn in PCA. One is what eigenvectors, the other one is about projections. So projection is a really key concept. And I'll illustrate graphically what uh, what then PCA is. But basically, each of these points gets projected onto this line. The line is defined by the vector u. This is the equation that does the projection for you. So the red vectors pi, those are the red dots here. Okay. Now, the key question that you then ask in PCA is, what line should I project onto? Okay. And you're trying to find the line that essentially um, maximizes the variance of the data. So what I'm showing you here is just different possible projections. Okay. So you see that the vector u is sort of rotating around and so is this line rotating around. And you see that, you know, depending on where the line is, um, the projection is different. And so what I want you to think about now is, at what point is variance of the red dots along that line maximized? When do you have the maximum spread along the red line? And maybe you can just shout now. Now, exactly. So that's when you have the maximum uh, spread. That's the axis you want to find, okay, of the maximum spread. That's one way of interpreting what you do in PCA, okay, maximum variance. But there's another way of interpreting what you do in PCA, um, and that is to think at what point are these red dots here as close as possible to the blue dots, okay? So graphically, what that means is you want to minimize the distance between these blue dots and the red dots, and that will happen if all these red lines here are as small as possible, or as short as possible, okay? That's sort of the explanation of PCA as the best compression of the data, given that you go from two to one dimension. So you want to be as close as possible to the original point. And now think when that's going to happen. Now, and the point is, it happens at exactly the same uh, point. Okay, so the two are equivalent. So whether you try to maximize the variance along this direction or whether you try to minimize the red lines, that's mathematically exactly the same thing. No, it's not. Because linear regression has a different uh, metric. Because so. Yeah, I cannot stop this actually. Uh, uh, anyways, but, but linear regression would basically, if you have it from here to here, linear regression only maximize, uh, minimizes in this direction because you're only interested in y. You're not interested in getting x as close as possible. So in linear regression, it, the output is the second axis, and that's your error. You only care about the error on the second axis. You don't actually care about, you know, the first axis is fixed. 
So that's why you only care about the error in uh, this direction. Okay. So, and the projection, the error of the these red lines, you can mathematically formulate. That shown here, it's basically the sum of all data points. So it goes from one to t in this case, assuming that t is like the number of time points. X i is the vector, one of these blue points here of your data points. U you transpose x i. That's your projection, and x i minus the projection, in these funny you know uh, double line that's called the norm. That's basically the length. It's just a shortcut for you know computing uh, the Euclidean metric. Okay, a applying Pythagoras if you want for the length between x i and these uh, points p i, and then you square that length. And the reason you square it is just because that's mathematically convenient. So that's the distance. And then you sum the distance over all points. So that gives you the overall distance. So all these red lines, you know, squared and summed together. And then you say, that's what I want to minimize. Okay? So that's how you formulate uh, PCA, for instance. So you say, I want to minimize this. With respect to what, actually? So you minimize, but what, are you, what is it that you're changing to minimize it? U, exactly. You change the direction U. Under the constraint that u has unit length, that's also important. Um, that is the reconstruction error, exactly. Yes, that's the reconstruction error. Projection error is reconstruction error. Okay, and then you know, as a little math exercise, for those of you who are curious, you can, if you multiply this out, reformulate this as this equation, which is minus u transpose times the sum over xi, xi transpose. These are the data points. And this actually is the covariance of the data points times u. And this is the other formulation of PCA. So just another, it's just summin summing this out, basically multiplying it out. And then this is u transpose times the covariance times u. The covariance is a matrix. and that basically just tells you you're also supposed to minimize the uh, negative uh, variance, which is maximizing the variance. So the minimum projection error is maximum variance. Okay. Now, the way we're going to do it numerically is going with the maximum variance formulation because that one is easier to handle. So we're going to say L is basically U transpose times this sum of all these data points times the data points transpose times U. Now this sum here, XI, XI transpose. Okay, XI, XI transpose is an outer product. Who knows what's an outer product? Okay, it's just the, you know, an inner product is basically a row vector times a column vector. And an outer product is a column vector times a row vector. The complication of the outer product is it gives you a matrix, okay? And this is basically a sum of outer products, so it's a sum of matrices. And if you sum them all up and you divide by the number of data points you have, then you call that the covariance matrix, okay? If the data is centered, okay? It's a covariance. Um, and you're supposed to minimize this or maximize this under the constraint that u is 1. And you can do that, you know, just by taking the derivative under a constraint, so it is a Lagrangian constraint. And actually, I don't think I'm going to do this for you. I'm just going to give you the solution. So if you take the derivative of that with respect to the vector u, so it may sound terrible to take a derivative with respect to a vector, but it actually just means you take a derivative with respect to all the individual elements of the vector, so you have to take like n derivatives. Or you can just look up a vector derivative, okay? Say in the matrix cookbook, a nice resource for taking these kind of things. So if you take the uh, vector derivative, then you will figure out this is the solution. C times u equals lambda times u. Okay? And this solution is known as the uh, eigenvector equation in linear algebra. Okay? Um, who's familiar with eigenvectors and eigenvalues? Okay, so many. So the key thing to basically notice is basically that is u is now called an eigenvector. C is the covariance matrix. U is an eigenvector. Lambda is the eigenvalue. And in terms of, we really just need to understand it in terms of PCA. But maybe I briefly explain the idea of an eigenvector. So a matrix times a vector. You can understand that you start with a vector, 
you push it through the matrix and you get out another vector. Okay? If that other vector didn't change direction, but it points still in the same direction, then it's called an eigenvector of the matrix. And lambda is just a scale factor that tells you how things scale. Um, and given that the covariance matrix is a positive definite matrix, we know from mathematics that lambda will always be positive. Lambda also has a special meaning because it's actually the variance of the data in the direction of u. Okay, so that's what the eigenvalue means. The variance of the data in the direction of u. Um, and u will be the principal uh, axis on which you want to project the data. So for now we just try to find one principal axis, the best. The interesting thing of this equation is that it doesn't just tell you the first principal axis, it will also tell you the next best principal axis, so the best two-dimensional subspace, the best three-dimensional subspace, four-dimensional subspace, etc. And the nice thing is if you use MATLAB or also Python, this is just a one-liner uh, to get back. Basically you say, you know, you get this covariance matrix C, and then MATLAB, for instance, will tell you all these vectors U and all the lambdas. Okay? So that's quick. And then what we'll have to do is basically, you know, ex uh, uh, compute the covariance matrix from the data, um, then push the covariance matrix through the eigenvector uh, formulation of MATLAB that gives us back these eigenvectors, and then we project the data onto these eigenvectors and plot it. Okay? And then we've done PCA. Now, one way of uh, thinking about PCA is that it's, in some sense, it's a bit as a, like a bottleneck. So you have these neural activities here. It could be uh, 113 or 370 we will have. And you push them through this principal component, okay, which is the projection onto one axis. And then you basically, you know, you map it back onto the original neurons. And then you can compare these projected activities with the, with the original activities. Okay? And that difference, that is what you're trying to minimize. Um, and of course, you can have a bottleneck that's just not just one axis, but there could be several axes. So it could be, for instance, a three-dimensional space. So you can think of it like this. Um, and what we're going to do is we're just going to apply it now to this uh, working memory task that we already worked with uh, earlier. Um, this is the type of population data we have. So here are the time points. These are the different firing rates. Or rather, that's the way we have to organize the data. Um, and one thing that you may wonder about, what are we supposed to do with all those conditions? You know, the stimulus frequency, the decisions, etc. Okay? And so here's the way we're going to handle it. We really have to think of these uh, data points as points in that space that just have different labels. Okay? So we can imagine that we sort the matrix in the following way. Here are all the neurons. There will be something like 370 neurons. And then we take condition number one. So condition one would be Stimulus frequency 1 is 10 hertz, and the decision is yes. Okay? And then we paste in the time series for that condition. So the PSDHs we computed for that condition, okay? for all neurons, basically, up to here. And then afterwards, we just take condition number 2. So, you know, stimulus frequency F1, decision no. Okay? F1 is 10 hertz, uh, and then uh, decision is no. And we paste that in. And then condition 3, etc. Okay, so that's how we construct the matrix. Because the key thing is to think of these vectors as the firing rate vector. And each firing rate vector just has a label. The label is, you know, when did it occur in the trial, what was the frequency, and what was the decision. In terms of PCA, the order here doesn't matter one bit. Because, you know, that's just, these are just labels on the dots that you had in this two-dimensional space, right? So we had this 2D space here. Um, PCA doesn't care about, you know, whether this was the first point or this was the first point or that was the first point. That doesn't matter at all, okay? So which way these points are sorted in that matrix doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that these are points, so that, you know, the first coordinate was minus 2 and the second coordinate was minus 1.5 in this case. Okay, that's the thing that matters. So that's the way you have to think about the conditions in, this in the task from Manolfo Romo. The conditions are just labels on your points. You have to keep track of, you know, what the conditions are in your matrix. But for PCA, it doesn't matter, okay? This is your matrix. Here you have your conditions, time, frequency, decision. For each point, you have time, frequency, and decision. Whichever way you scramble the matrix doesn't matter. It's going to give you exactly the same output in terms of PCA because all the covariance matrices are going to be exactly the same. 
<coughs> and so the exercise is now the following. So first you load the MATLAB file that has the all the PSD ages from uh, Ronulfo Romo's data. Okay? So some of you have managed to do a single PSD age. Now you imagine that you had all of the PSD ages and then they're sorted in the following way. There's a cell array, so there's three dimension that has number of neurons times number of conditions times number of time points. And you are now supposed to reshape that array. MATLAB has a function reshape and I assume Python has some similar function called reshape, exactly. And you reshape it into a matrix of neurons times conditions times time points. Then once you have this matrix, you know, first thing you should probably do is just plot it. Just to make sure you know you understand what you did. So we can just plot it using, for instance, image just C as a false color plot. Okay? So you one quick way of plotting a matrix just as a false color plot. Then you're supposed to center the data. So I'm not going to give you any more details on that, but you're supposed to take this matrix X and center the data. Then you're supposed to compute and plot the covariance matrix. Then you determine the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. Then you plot the eigenvalues. And then you plot the first principal component. Okay? And you have until 6 o'clock.